over the past century or so, life expectancy across the entire world has increased exponentially. There are many people who are optimistic that the average life expectancy across the entire world will be above 100. There's some people who even think that in the next 10 or 20 years, humans are going to reach immortality. Now, personally, I don't really care about living forever, but I would be interested in trying to extend my lifespan a little bit. So in this video, I'm going to outline my personal plan of what I'm going to do to try to live until 100. But do you want to slow down aging and live longer? If yes, then I'm looking for more people who want to reverse their biological clock. If you're interested, then email me the word health to info at and I'll send you the details. Do it. Yeah, I'm not really like attached to the idea of trying to live until 100 years old. I mean, it would be pretty cool. I think it would be pretty awesome to see that uh, the average life expectancy in humans would be above 100. But personally, the reason I'm interested in the anti-aging and longevity science itself is because it's essentially the hardest problem in biology and medicine like how do you solve aging and how do you like extend lifespan so now this is out of the way let me give some backstory to myself and like what's my background well if you're new here then my name is Seem Lund I'm a 28 year old Estonian living in Estonia I am very healthy I'm very fit I don't have any health issues I've never had any health issues and I've never really had any complaints about my health either but I do have like some let's say bad genetics as well for example my grandfather from my mother's side died at the age of 36 to colorectal cancer. He also had two brothers who both died at a young age as well. Both of my grandmothers are alive and uh, they're in their 70s with uh, relatively good health. My father's side grandfather has also passed away. He died at the age of 74. So from my mother's side of the family, I have a history of uh, males dying very young. But having certain genetic predispositions doesn't mean that those, first of all, those genes get activated or that they would actually end up killing you. Your lifestyle and epigenetics, so the things that you're exposed to, your diet, how healthy you are, etc. Those things generally are more important for longevity and how long you live. However, if you have some very serious genes that may increase the risk of certain diseases a lot, then uh, of course those genes will have a massive influence on how long you will actually live. The best medicine is prevention and if you like detect the presence of cancer or heart disease before it actually becomes serious, then you're at a huge advantage. Whereas if you detect it too late, then uh, you have to kind of pay, play catch up and it might be too late even, especially with cancers. Big mistake. Now, the first thing I have to talk about is DNA testing. So I think it's very important to know your risk factors for the main killers in society. And the number one killer in the world is heart disease. There are several genes that affect the risk of heart disease, but the most known risk factor is the APOE gene. Fortunately, I don't have the APOE4 alleles, which is the highest risk factor. And I actually have the APOE2 and 3 allele, which is reducing my risk for heart disease from saturated fat intake. I also know that I have a genetically higher risk for cancer and uh, this is something that I will pay attention to in my routines later down the line as well. But I don't have any other serious risk for other diseases. So that's why I think like having your DNA tested once in your life is still very well worth it, especially if you are interested in optimizing your longevity and health span. But let's move on with my current lifestyle. What am I doing in my 20s right now to maximize my health span and longevity? First of all, we have to realize that what you do in your 20s may be completely different what you need in your 60s or 70s. 70s, for example. Throughout your life, your body goes through different age-related changes that need to be taken into account and you need to adjust your routine based on that. But there are some key principles that stay the same all throughout your life, such as you need to maintain a relatively lower body weight, don't get diabetes, don't get obesity, don't get metabolic syndrome, don't develop hypertension, eat a good well-balanced diet, exercise regularly, get enough sleep, maintain good stress and maintain social relationships. Those are the most clear associations with longevity and these are the fundamentals of having a good healthy lifespan. So in my 20s right now my main focus is to maximize my muscle strength and fitness because this is the best time to do so and with age you do see a progressive decrease in many of the fitness parameters such as muscle strength, muscle mass, VO2 max, gait speed, flexibility, coordination etc. So you should think about your 20s and 30s as a time of building your fitness and building your body up so that you would maintain it for longer. A lot of my focus in terms of working out in my 20s right now is to do strength training, mostly weightlifting with the main compound lifts such as deadlift, squat, bench, pull-ups, overhead press, etc. These are the biggest bang for your buck in terms of building muscle mass and muscle strength. Working out with machines doesn't really build your bone density as much as barbells do. 
The second fitness goal in my 20s right now is also to increase my VO2 max and cardiorespiratory fitness. There is a linear association between low cardiorespiratory fitness and increased mortality. The individuals with the lowest cardiorespiratory fitness have almost a 50% higher chance of mortality compared to the individuals with extreme cardiorespiratory fitness. So you definitely also want to work out with cardio, including weights. You want to do both, like you shouldn't neglect one or the other because both are going to have an important role. You see a decline in your VO2 max with age and you see a decline with in your strength with age as well. In my 20s, however, I'm not really trying to fully maximize my muscle mass. Like if you're 20 years old, even 30 years old, building muscle comes as a byproduct of building strength. It's very easy to build muscle before your 40s because you're still very insulin sensitive and you're also anabolic sensitive. Your hormones work properly and you should build muscle relatively easily. You start to lose the muscle mass significantly faster after your 40s and 50s. So that's the time where I will shift my focus into more hypertrophy style training to maintain the muscle tissue and to support it. Currently, my body weight is 82, 83 kilograms, which puts me at a BMI of of around 26. Now this is still the sweet spot for BMI. If you have slightly more muscle mass, then yeah, your BMI is going to be slightly elevated. However, you should never reach the point where your BMI is above 30, even if you have muscle and even if you are relatively strong. The reason has to do with just the wear and tear and the burden on your organs and just carrying around that mass. Too much muscle is still not that optimal. And I personally think that in your 20s, like you should still maintain a BMI between something like 22 up until like 27 at most or 28. And when you look at studies, then the lowest mortality in people around 40 years old is between a BMI of 22 to 25. 48% body fat. And I also have to include one very important part of this entire longevity equation, which is social relationships and having like a purpose and meaning. So the different kinds of uh, regions in the world, they have many things in common. One of the main things in common is that they live in very small social communities, which strengthens their bonds and maintains happiness, lowers stress and ease. So it's actually one of the biggest associations with longevity, having social relationships, especially in your later life. My plan for that is to stay married with my wife for the rest of my life. I'm already married, yes, and we got married like seven months ago. And uh, yeah, like we just love each other a lot and uh, we see no reason or no uh, issues with maintaining our marriage for the rest of our life. Now, let's talk about my diet. I've been doing intermittent fasting for 10 years and it works great for me. I'm able to build muscle, able to build strength and maintain lower body fat percentage year round. My eating window usually consists of two protein meals. So the first meal of protein usually before my training and it consists of around 30 grams of protein. The reason has to do with the fact that it's very hard to build muscle with like one meal a day and just adding that extra protein in there helps to achieve the goals that I have. Then after my workout, I'll have the second meal, which comprises the most of my calories. Now, this is something that I have been doing for the last six years and it hasn't stopped working so far. <laughs> my blood work is excellent. My body composition is excellent and I'm progressing at the gym. I do think that there are some longevity benefits to intermittent fasting as well, but there's no evidence to suggest that uh, this kind of uh, eating window has like any longevity benefits. I personally do think that I'm inclined to think that, but uh, of course, this is uh, something just my own opinion. This is the eating window that I will make maintain probably up until my 40s. Then I will have to include an additional meal that includes protein so that I would be able to maintain the muscle mass more easily. So that, like I said, if you are in your 40s, then your anabolic sensitivity decreases and it's slightly harder to maintain and build muscle tissue. I'll be having probably breakfast, lunch and dinner, but I will still have like an earlier dinner to reap the benefits of early time restricted eating. And I do think that early time restricted eating is the best like eating window for the anti-aging longevity benefits. What it will look like precisely, I don't know yet, but it's probably going to be like breakfast, higher protein, lunch, higher protein with some carbs and dinner, lower protein with uh, higher carbs. But once I get to my 60s and 70s, and 80s, then I will have to include a fourth meal as well. But it doesn't need to be an actual meal. I'll probably be just having a protein snack. So three meals plus a fourth protein snack, which will be probably like some protein, protein powder or protein bar, Greek yogurt, uh, beef jerky snack or whatever else. What kind of foods do I eat? I eat a relatively higher carb intake right now. And I do think that in your 20s and 30s, it is very beneficial to be eating a higher carb intake as opposed to a lower carb intake. 
because the reason has to do with your thyroid and metabolic rate. Carbs do have a more positive effect on your thyroid functioning and metabolic rate. And if you start to tanking your thyroid hormones already in your 20s and 30s, then I think you're going to just have a slightly harder time in your 40s and 50s. So it's much better to reap the benefits of a higher baseline higher metabolic rate in your 20s and 30s and to feed it with the appropriate amounts of carbohydrates. This is going to maintain my metabolic rate for a lot longer and uh, it's actually much easier for me to maintain lower body fat percentage with a higher carb intake than a higher fat intake. And I think this is a diet that I will maintain for as long as possible. There are some changes that I would make in my 50s. For example, in my 50s, I would start to reduce the carbohydrate intake and to increase the protein intake because the protein is actually more important for maintaining the muscle tissue, which starts to decline in your 40s and 50s. I'll probably reduce my carbohydrate intake by 10% and bump up my fat intake by maybe 5% and bump up my protein intake as well by 5%. Awesome, I love protein. All right, let's talk about supplements. I have a full guide to my personal supplements that I take, but in this video, I'll just mention like a few of the key supplements that I think have the most beneficial effect. Number one is gonna be collagen and glycine because your collagen starts to decrease already in your 20s. Glycine also has many anti-aging and longevity benefits. I'll take that for the rest of my life. Glucosamine is a supplement that helps with inflammation and joint pain, and I don't want to wait until I actually get and degraded cartilage and collagen, I want to start supporting the cartilage with the glucosamine in my 20s already. And glucosamine use is also associated with increased life expectancy and reduced mortality. Some other key supplements that I'll take for the rest of my life, even now, are going to be NAC, trimethylglycine, creatine, magnesium, and vitamin K2 for the thrombosis and cardiovascular disease effects. And I take a supplement called calcium alpha ketoglutarate, which has been found to reduce biological age in humans. Of course, it's a still a very new supplement. We don't have a lot of data about it. But I personally think that uh, I am optimistic about the supplement and I'm um, just adding it to my stack right now already. In my 30s, I will also start taking NMN regularly to boost my NAD levels. Right now, I'm not taking it every day. I'm taking it occasionally. But in my 30s, I'll start taking it pretty much regularly every day because with age, your NAD levels decrease and uh, having a higher NAD level is beneficial for many aspects of aging, especially fitness. In my 30s, I'll also start taking more regularly different kinds of senolytics like fisetin and quercetin to help with the clearance of senescent cells, which do begin to accumulate. And right now, even I'm taking like a microdose of melatonin, not every night, but pretty much every night, which is going to be 0.3 milligrams. So 300 micrograms is the amount your body makes approximately itself and supporting it with a microdose of melatonin. I think it's uh, just beneficial for the sleep quality and the antioxidant benefits of melatonin. But you don't want to take like a large dose of melatonin in your youth. There's no like reason to do that. You're just going to get like this melatonin hangover. <laughs> You're just going to feel very groggy and tired in the next morning. However, starting in your 50s and 60s, you see that your body's natural melatonin production decreases quite a lot. So this is a time where I will start taking a larger dose of melatonin every night. So I'll take like one to three milligrams of melatonin when I'm 50s or 60s so that uh, I would have just better sleep quality and I would sleep longer. So like the elderly, they sleep very short and part of it has to do with the low uh, melatonin levels. I don't sleep, I wait. Now, when it comes to like actual longevity drugs and pharmaceuticals like rapamycin and metformin, then I haven't made up my mind whether or not I will take it, but I will probably consider taking them when I'm like like 40s or 50s. I don't see any reason for me to take rapamycin or metformin right now. There's a very limited evidence to suggest that it would be beneficial for someone in 20s or 30s. And I would, you know, in the next 10 years or so, I'm sure we will have actual studies showing what are the effects of more like longevity effects of uh, rapamycin. But I do think that rapamycin is certainly like the most powerful longevity pharmaceutical out there. And it probably has some life extension effects. That's my personal opinion. At least it does in virtually all other animal species. And now let's talk about the different blood tests as well as screening for certain uh, diseases. So I'll be doing like a full blood panel at least once a year just to keep track of uh, my health markers. And again, it's one of the most powerful preventive healthcare strategy that you have. If you just look at your blood work and you see, okay, my blood sugar is starting to get too high or my cholesterol is starting to get too high, my inflammation is starting to get too high, whatever it is, you can just make the right decisions to adjust and improve your blood work because your blood work is almost like the trajectory of your health. If your blood work is already messed up in your 20s, then chances are you're shortening your lifespan quite a lot unless you make the changes that you need to make. But if your blood work is perfect and you also follow the other lifestyle recommendations based on science that we know are associated with longevity, then your chances of living longer are exponentially higher. So taking like a full blood panel once a year that includes lipids, blood sugar levels, 
hormones, blood cells, liver enzymes, etc., then that's just one of the smartest thing in my opinion. I don't think there's a point in doing like blood work every month or like several times a year unless you're like tracking certain changes, like unless you're tracking your blood sugar or unless you're tracking your hormones, for example, then it does make sense to maybe test that specific single marker every few months. But uh, if you're just looking for the entire like health checkup, then just doing it once a year is enough. Another important measurement you can measure at home is actually your blood pressure. So blood pressure is a huge risk factor for many diseases, especially cardiovascular disease. I usually measure my blood pressure like once a month to see that, yeah, it's, it's fine, it's normal, and uh, there's no issues with it. Chill out. Now, when it comes to my specific genetic predispositions, which are colorectal cancer from my grandfather and also heart disease from his brothers, then I have to pay more attention to those particular diseases. Now, cancer screening is relatively complex, but I think it's the most powerful predictor to make sure that uh, you're not going to die to cancer. Because if you find the cancer before it has fully developed or become metastatic, then uh, it's uh, much easier to deal with it. Unfortunately, with the colorectal cancer, then like the most easiest or like one of the simplest ways to uh, screen for the colorectal cancer is with a colonoscopy but uh, yeah usually they start taking the colonoscopies uh, or recommended for men around 45 years of age but my grandfather died to colorectal cancer when he was 36 years old I'm not gonna start taking like regular colonoscopies every year or something like that I might have one like in my like early 30s or mid 30s somewhere around there just to make sure that there's nothing there and if there is isn't anything there then I'll just wait until my 40s or 45, at which time it is recommended for men to start uh, screening for the colorectal cancer or some other types of cancers uh, as well. But there are also some different kinds of screening methods for different cancers, and it doesn't have to involve a colonoscopy always. There are actually like a virtual colonoscopy as well, which uses like x-rays to look into your colon. So there are, yeah, different methods. Of course, like if you have already messed up a blood work, then that can also be a sign of something going wrong. For heart disease, it's going to be a bit simpler there's going to be the CT scan that looks at the calcium score of your arteries and looks at how much calcium deposits there are. Of course, it's not a perfect test, but I think that, you know, if my blood work is fine, then I might just, uh, every few years or so, I'll just get a CT scan to see what's the situation starting in my 40s or mid 40s. At the last test, that is a good thing to do every once in a while, maybe every few years, is the body composition uh, test. So like a DEXA scan that looks at your muscle mass, your fat mass and especially visceral fat so the fat around the organs now let's talk about hormones and trt so uh, generally you see a decline in sex hormones as well in your 40s already for the average male personally i think that testosterone replacement therapy and hormone replacement therapy are very powerful at, for at least increasing or improving the quality of life but i don't think that i will need to start it in my 40s Maybe in my late 40s, maybe if I'm 48 years old or something, but uh, generally I would suspect that uh, I'll start using TRT if I'm like uh, 50s or something. And that includes also like different kinds of peptides that uh, may have like some anti-aging be benefits like growth hormone peptides or uh, IG-1 peptides. But again, like these things are very, uh, let's say they come with, they have like double-edged sword effects as well. So like high IG-1 may increase the risk of cancer. So I think that I've, I would never like actually benefit from taking IG-1 as a peptide even. And uh, yeah, like although my IG-1 levels are always low, they're like on the lower end. And uh, that's actually beneficial in my opinion for longevity in my age right now. Of course, there are some safer peptides like with less side effects like BPC-157, which is like a joint and tendon rejuvenation peptide that helps to heal the gut actually and um, repair uh, injuries and tendons, etc. This is something, I mean, if I need to take it, I'll probably probably take it already in my 30s or 20s but I don't have I've never had any injuries I've never had any like back pain or any like joint pain or anything like that I've never injured myself during exercise or sport so uh, yeah I'm, unless I need to I'm not gonna take the BPC even if I'm like 30 or 40 years old I think this is a pretty good overview of my plan of maintaining health and longevity for as long as possible. Of course, I don't know when I'm going to die, like none of us uh, do. But I believe in the next 10 or 20 years, we will see uh, quite a lot of breakthroughs in health and medicine as well that will just by default increase the life expectancy of average people even who don't follow this healthy biohacker lifestyle. And uh, for them, it, it's I think it's probably very possible for the average lifespan life expectancy across the world to increase to maybe 90 years old, maybe 100 years old if you're like relatively healthier. But other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure to click a like, subscribe, notification bell as well. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.